The ability to connect with people and form real relationships is often damaged in those of us who were neglected or abused as children. And when you pull away from people and intentionally isolate yourself, and that's common, it's called avoidance. But you might be someone who doesn't intentionally isolate, you might be a covert avoider. For example, you could have a good career, you're friendly, you're interesting, there are people in your life, friends, maybe a partner or spouse, but there are hidden covert ways that you keep your interactions superficial. You know, you keep one foot out of the relationship without anyone quite realizing it. Sometimes you don't even realize it. But if you've been trying and trying to connect better with people and you don't seem to be getting any traction, it's time to look at whether maybe you're secretly, covertly avoiding people and your own life. Now I'm gonna talk about how we do covert avoidance and how to shift those behaviors if you're ready, if you wanna open this up and make this the year you get better at meeting and caring for people in your life. All right, so avoidant behavior is really normal for people who had trauma when they were kids. If that's you, you may have learned to look okay on the outside, being cheerful, appropriate, functioning well, but you probably also learned to protect your inner state by avoiding any kind of situation that might trigger you, things like rejection or criticism or getting ostracized by a group. So those hurtful things hurt all kinds of people, but for a person with complex PTSD, it can make you feel destroyed. It can trigger a period of dysregulation that makes it really hard to think and focus and function for days. And I talk a lot about dysregulation on this channel. You might want to explore that. But here's the first reason I'm going to give you to start healing your avoidant tendencies now, because even though getting triggered can feel like it destroys you, if you go through life rigidly protecting yourself from the way you feel around people, that destroys you too, and probably in a worse way. Without connection, your development gets frozen. On the outside, you might look confident and accomplished, but inside you're like a sad little kid just walking around. Now I call the problem covert avoidance because it's not like avoidant personality disorder, which is an extreme kind of anxiety and social avoidance. That's on a level that would be fairly noticeable to other people. But covert avoidance isn't that noticeable. You seem okay. You're interacting with the world, but you're also holding yourself apart from it. So one big sign of covert avoidance is when you're too busy or too tired all the time to do normal things that a person in your position would do, like keeping where you live tidy or making decent food for yourself and your kids, perhaps or going to bed on time, or getting up on time. When you're avoiding this level of functioning, it's an inward-directed kind of avoidance. Then there are the outward behaviors, like being late to things. And it's normal to be late occasionally, but if you're known for being late, if you're late by about the same number of minutes every time, it's avoidance. That was the big obvious sign that I had back in the days when I was near the end of my first marriage and when my kids were small. I was late to everything. If I said I'd come to your house at 4 o'clock, I'd be there at 4.13. If I had an important phone call that was supposed to be at 9 o'clock, I'd join at 9.02. And if a group of friends were meeting up for a hike, I'd keep everyone waiting in the parking lot for 15 minutes. And you know, I always had my reasons. There was traffic, I had kids, and I was busy, I was juggling a lot. It was all true. But here's the sign. I was always telling people how busy I was. Do you do that? People would say, how have you been, Anna? And I'd go, mm, busy. I've been really busy. And I'd say it almost like I was bragging, like it was a badge of accomplishment that proved that I was doing something really important and excused my inconsiderate behavior. And I know now that my busyness is it's part of life and not always a good sign about how I'm managing my time. And that my broadcasting my busyness to the world is actually a form of covert avoidance. So being busy all the time, talking about being busy. For me, it was an attempt to keep everyone's focus like out here and not in here where I wasn't feeling that great about myself. I wasn't doing that well. And the thing is, even though I was juggling a lot at the time, I was working, I was a single mom or I transitioned into it then, you could take everything I did in one day to which I was showing up late and you could do it in the same amount of time by just shifting everything 20 minutes earlier. And then I'd be on time for everything. And I would have been so much less stressed. So in my mind, I couldn't make that shift because I was too busy. And in reality, I was shutting people out. I was shutting my life out. I was angry at my life and I didn't 
want to be in it really that's what was really going on and in particular i was unhappy about my recently ended marriage and i was emotionally overwhelmed I was overwhelmed pretty much all the time. And rather than be real about that and face it, I hung on to the marriage for as long as I could and then tried to keep every, everything else in my life like at arm's length and keep up appearances. I'm doing great, everything's fine. So that's the second reason I'm giving you today about why now is a good time to start healing your covert avoidance. When you start opening up to real connection with people, you'll begin to see more clearly, you know, what you've been afraid to look at in your own life. Whatever you've been ashamed of, whatever has felt undoable for you, when you stop hiding, you'll be better able to see. And yes, other people will be able to see too, but actually that lets them get closer to you. So back in the days when I was shutting people out, I didn't know exactly how to start opening up to people. <laughs> how do you make that work? It hadn't gone well for me in the past. And back then I didn't know that what was going on with me was PTSD from childhood. I thought I was just a big secret failure. I thought other people just knew how to do this life thing and there was just some mystery problem with me. And I was trying really hard to have good relationships and I was, I was just going about it wrong. I was trying not to be any trouble for people. And it's probably from some old idea from childhood that my feelings and my needs and even my existence were a problem for other people. And I'm not saying that people who, you know, start to like need so much from other people that it couldn't be a problem. But I was just like trying to avoid ever being seen that way. So I just try to muddle through and getting through hard times all by yourself. It's a good thing to know how to do, but there comes a time when the avoidance has to stop if you're going to be happy. So it came to a head when I had this like three year, four year period where I had a huge medical problem and it started with an injury and it snowballed into a whole series of surgeries that kept having complications. And this was right when my kids, dad and I were separated and getting divorced and we were hardly speaking to each other. And because for years I'd formed only, you know, superficial, put on your happy face friendships, I wasn't close to anybody anymore. And that meant I had almost no support. So one time I went a whole week in the hospital with just one visitor for maybe an hour. And when it was time to go home, I needed somebody who could pick me up and drive me. Literally by law, they can't let you just take a cab. So while I could see other people in the hospital getting flowers and hugs and happy families coming to drive them home, I had to just sit there making 10 phone calls till I could find someone who could, you know, take a couple hours out of their day and come get me and take me home. And someone came, God bless them, and they got me some takeout food and got me settled on the sofa and kept me company for a little while. <sighs> but this had been going on for a long time and it was going to go on for a long time. Not having the kind of relationships that could sustain me in hard times like that was like what my life was all about back then. And that's what chronic avoidance will get you. You might get through one crisis by avoiding people in life, but the next crisis is going to come and lay you low. It's just part of life. You'll face for real what's left when you spent years thinking you had no choice but to protect yourself from people, protecting that fragile place inside of you that lives in fear of being judged and left out and alone. You really do end up alone when you do that. And that's the third reason I'm giving you to start healing covert avoidance now. When life gets hard, you'll need people who care about you and they'll care for you because there's a long history of close connection with you and caring both ways. And you'll have love and friendship. And that's a very good way to live your life. It's worth it. So those are the three reasons I'm urging you to begin healing your avoidant tendencies right now. You can make this the year you do it. Okay, the first reason is not learning to connect will drain your life of depth and meaning and the opportunity to overcome social limitations that have held you back. Yes, people are triggering, but being limited in this way where you can't develop is even worse. Two, coming out of hiding and opening up to people will allow you to see clearly and face more honestly the parts of your life where you're struggling, the problems that need your attention. You getting real about what's not working for you yet can be a positive step that feels really good especially if you've lined up some guidance, some ways to learn about CPTSD, and most importantly, some support from people who understand the trauma you've been through. And finally, the third reason it's important to heal your avoidant tendencies now, it's because there may come a time when handling everything in isolation won't be enough. You're going to need help, and help is a beautiful word. 
You can begin to grow these lifelines of help right now by asking for help. You can offer help. You can learn to set boundaries so that when someone asks too much from you, which might be one of your fears, you know how to say no in the most graceful way possible. And you can also support your healing of avoidance by learning to calm triggers that make closeness with people so challenging. You can learn how to do that in my free daily practice course. I'm always talking about it. It's always linked down below in the description section too. We have lots of people who do that. I do free calls every two weeks. You're welcome to join me. When you can reduce your reactivity to things that used to be hard for you, you have more choices about how you want to respond. So maybe you need less contact with hurtful people and more contact with supportive people. Hmm? <laughs> and who these people are will become clearer to you when you're more regulated and less reactive. And finally, you can raise your awareness of covert avoidance and begin noticing where are you doing it? I had one friend who said she used to go around to parties with a camera around her neck so that if she were speaking with someone for more than a couple of minutes, she could say she needed to leave the conversation and go take pictures. Or she used a clipboard in her hand. I've done that before with a pen. And you can walk around a party as if you're enjoying it like an observer, but never risk getting ignored or drowned in a conversation. So covert avoidance is subtle. It's kind of like an old friend that's hard to let go of. Some of us do it by looking at our phones all the time. Some of us do it by taking unfulfilling jobs and then hating that job and postponing the day when we're going to start living our life until after we leave that job that we never should have taken in the first place. And then we've got a great excuse not to volunteer at the school or not to take a walk with our friend or we find ourselves collapsed on the sofa every evening. And even at home, we can do covert avoidance with people we love, just going through the motions. Or we stay with people we never loved, just buying some time for that day when we can emotionally handle making changes. You can do avoidance through food, drugs, video games, or anything that numbs you. Telling yourself that as soon as you can stop, you'll get out there and start your life. I totally get it. I've done it. <laughs> and until you have a way to calm your triggers and handle stress when it comes, because it always is going to come, your CPTSD is going to dictate that you will be cut off from your own life. You were born with a desire and a need to love and connect. And you needed it, not only because you were a good, sweet little baby, but because your nervous system was still forming and needed to learn and practice how to survive and participate in human life. We are tribal creatures and knowing how to connect with people and build mutual trust and to hold a boundary. These are all skills we were supposed to learn from our parents. And yet so many of us grew up more or less feral on connection and boundaries. And it can make it really, really hard to have a fulfilling relationship or to tell when we're being fed crumbs. So my letter today is from a woman I'll call Maisie. And she writes, Hi, Anna. Growing up, my dad was and is a self-employed workaholic. He would never take breaks unless he was too sick to move and would never spend a full day at home. I would only see him about an hour in the morning and then at 9 p.m. My family often had to go to family parties alone and then wait until my dad showed up halfway through. He was always caught up in his own things and would not prioritize our family besides monetarily. My family in general does not have healthy boundaries. I believe both my parents have CPTSD, but my dad is very avoidant and fawns and my mom is avoidant and fights. Our house is small and we tend to always be in the same room when we're together. <laughs> this is what a picture. So we never learned how to be separate in a healthy way. It tends to just build up until someone can't take it. And then they leave for hours without saying when they'll be back. And that was very stressful as a kid since it was, it was too extreme. Spending every second together when we were annoyed or having someone leave with no end point. I have been in an entirely long distance relationship for about two years. My boyfriend and I met in college, but only started spending time alone together a week before everything was shut down for COVID. We had known each other for a few months before that, but only talked in group settings with mutual friends. Neither of us have been in long term in a long term relationship before this. We've been dr a driving distance of four plus hours our whole relationship. So building a connection has taken a lot longer than I assume it would in normal relationships. 
a recurring fight between us is that he is very emotionally distant when we're not together. He does not like texting, calling, or video chat. He always says that he prefers to talk in person. But when we visit, which is only about once a month because of the drive, he tends to shut down and box me out emotionally about three days in. When he boxes me out, I tend to shut down or get very passive aggressive and start fights. He also likes to walk around constantly, like walk around outside or alone in new towns. But that often leaves me alone with no sense of when he's coming back. When I get upset, he feels like he can't leave, which makes more tension. I want to note that the first few days are nice and we get along. I feel very insecure in the relationship sometimes because we have a communication disconnect. I feel like all of my communication needs have to just not exist. There it is. Since he is uncomfortable using the phone. Plus, since he always says he doesn't like talking on the phone, that also makes me feel abandoned. And then I start to fight. I feel like that is the only way he responds. And I know that is bad for the relationship. I feel like he's often too avoidant, but since that is a major trigger from growing up, I really don't know how to handle it. I know that he will come back and that he cares about me, but I know that when I start fights, when I feel triggered, it only makes it worse for us. It is very hard to deal with our issues when we do not communicate well over the phone and only see each other once a month. I have tried the daily practice a couple times, but I have not done it consistently. It's helped, but I have so much to unpack that I am still writing four pages of fears and resentments every time. It's hard to know if the relationship is worth it since it feels like we barely can even build a consistent connection. Any advice would be appreciated. Maisie. All right, Maisie. I was circling things as I went. I just wanted to read through your whole story and then come back and see. I'm going to read back to you what you told me. I think I can help. Okay. So you had this parent situation, very unusual home, very small, everybody stuck together and nobody learned how to deal with conflict except to run away. So, you know, escaping conflict, it's really good in the short run and the long run, it, it sort of thwarts development. There's no personal growth there to learn how do you talk through a conflict and resolve it. That's also a reason why drugs and alcohol are a problem in relationships because if you just kind of like blot it out, whether it's drugs, alcohol, running away, food, you know, just weed, whatever it is, if you're blotting it out, there's a whole bunch of feelings that are going unprocessed. And that's one of the things I've noticed about people who smoke a lot of pot is they, I've just noticed there's a lot of anger there. There's a lot of suppressed anger. And when they get angry, they get really angry. And that's consistent with CPTSD, really, that there's emotional dysregulation and then some attempt to try to control emotions somehow. So some of us use avoidant relationships. Some of us use drugs. Some of us use food. And we're working our way towards the day when we can kind of face what those feelings are, what the thought, it's not all about feelings. It's also just thoughts, beliefs that we have that we get on paper in the daily practice. We're talking about the daily practice. So for anybody new to the channel, the daily practice is a set of two techniques that I've been using for 28 years and I teach everybody. It's free. There's always a link to it down below in the description section. It's also on the free tools page of my website, but it's a writing technique where you name your fearful and resentful thoughts, ask for them to be removed or release them as the case may be, depending on your spiritual beliefs, and then a calm meditation. So just explaining this reference to the daily practice that Maisie brought up. Yes, it's a way to start moving your feelings through. You need the feelings build up because you're alive and because a lot has happened and because you're in a painful situation right now, where will they go? And what happens if there's no healthy way to process them, it can distort your perception. And that's why you're afraid that you can't really read the situation. I think this situation is pretty plain actually. And I think you know what it is that I will see in it and what other people will see in it. Um, and I'll just cut to the chase. This sounds like a crap relationship, terrible crap fit. I'll, you know, I just, I'm not getting it. He sounds like a very difficult avoidant person. And while it's understandable that some people are avoidant, it doesn't make for a good relationship. This thing where he can't talk on the phone or text, and <laughs> if, if you only see each other once a month, this is a, this sounds like a situation of convenience, um, not a relationship. I don't hear any part where 
uh, your feelings and what you need out of it. Now, I, I don't, I, you'll hear, I don't really talk about needs. When people say I need my needs met, I like to be very clean. We're never technically abandoned as adults and we don't technically have needs that other people need to meet unless we are, um, you know, unable to care for ourselves for some reason. Then there's a, there are stages in life when we all need other people to care for us. And so that's when we need our need, get our needs met. I find it helpful just to remember the things I actually need, I don't need a partner to make happen for me. So they don't have to meet my needs. They, they meet my hopes. <laughs> they meet my desires or my hopes, or they don't. But it's really helpful to recognize it's something you want, because if you're not getting something you want, that means one thing. It means, oh, maybe you need to go do something else versus what you need, which is why we get angry. The anger, I'm just projecting here, but when you get angry at the way he just completely emotionally neglects you and anything that you would want to do with time and that you want to connect, I assume this is a sexual relationship, of course you want to connect and talk and stay connected. What could be more natural? So he, he won't give that to you and you fight. So I want you to stop beating yourself up for fighting. Yes, the anger is probably coming from that well of child pain down there, baby pain, you know, where you, a baby is mad when, when their needs aren't met. There's, there's anger in the way baby, babies cry, and you see that come up in us, you know, when, we're, when relationships are empty. The, the thing about CPTSD is that we hang around for this and we keep thinking, just as it's only right and just that your mom and dad would have stopped their shenanigans and stopped and paid attention to you and taught you how to live. That is the right thing. It's not what all of us got. Not everybody is capable of giving that. And that's the hand you were dealt and kind of similar to mine. And so it's not right, but it is, it is, it is so. With a partner, they don't owe you anything. When you're dating somebody, you know, a marriage is sort of an agreement or some kind of a commitment is an agreement that you will uh, help someone in some way that you mutually understand. And so marriage is a common template for that and uh, a very strong one and quite serious. You know, if you marry somebody, they don't always tell you this because the first time I got married, it was very quickly done. And what I didn't know until later is that like now you share the debt of their tax bill. <laughs> Who knew? People don't talk about that, but it is, it's like a promise. It's a responsibility. And now I'm married for real with a full consciousness of all the responsibilities. And it means that if, if my husband or I really feel like we need to talk, the other person has an obligation to find a time to do that and to show up for that conversation. That's what our commitment means, among many other things. Um, so you're, you're going without a commitment and you're filling in, you're backfilling this big gap there in, in somebody not giving you just basics of boyfriend, girlfriend stuff. You're backfilling it with this idea that maybe it's just your childhood stuff. And you know, we all do that. And your childhood stuff is what's telling you to stay in this relationship. Your common sense is telling you that this is, you know, BS. This is not good. And it's never going to feel good. Somebody cannot ha this. Yeah, no, you want a relationship. You actually want to talk and be connected. You've picked a turnip. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no human being is a turnip. But <laughs> as partners go, this is somebody who like cannot do it. They cannot do it. So it's hard to face when we get attached. We get attached so very hard, right? This thing where you fight I, I agree that it would be good for you to work on that. I think if you couldn't fight about it, what you'd be forced to recognize, because fighting, it's like, it's a release of, of sorts. It's an escape from the feelings when you feel like, oh my gosh, you know, this guy like really doesn't love me and I'm not, this is not going to work. I'm going to have to leave. Like that is such a terrible thought to a person with CPTSD who's been neglected that a fight just feels like, oh yay. It's like, it's like the dog chasing the squirrel, you know, something else to go after instead of the pain of what you're not getting. And it's sad, but you can do better. You can. The path to true love begins with deciding to no longer have crap fit love and crap fit. That's my word for when we fit ourselves to situations that are actually unacceptable. People with characteristics that are actually unacceptable to us. You get to decide what you really want and you get to own that. And so many of us have had that squashed down. We somehow feel it's shameful and unspeakable that we want someone to love us and stay with us. You get to own that. You get to have that. That is okay. 
Having CPTSD is a normal reaction to abnormal circumstances growing up. Falling in love and wanting a commitment is a normal reaction to being alive. So you're okay. You're okay. You're just crap fitting. That's all. That's what this sounds like. And um, part of you knows to rail against the injustice of it. But all's fair. When you're an adult in love, you know, in a relationship, all is fair. You can only have what another person is willing to give. So that's what I suggest to you. You said that you've done the daily practice a couple times. Come back. Come like, do it for real. Do it for real twice a day. Come take, you know, you can come to the free calls that I lead for everybody who takes the free course. If you become a member, you can come to daily peer led daily practice calls. We have like three or four a day. It's pretty wonderful on a community of members who they're using the daily practice. They're supporting each other in it. And it's a way that you can have friendships with people who are also walking the same path and agree with this idea. Like we need a way to process these fearful and resentful thoughts, like going out and trying to talk about them all the time isn't always productive for those of us who have, you know, CPTSD hamsters running in a wheel in there, just like everything's terrible, everything's terrible. You know, you tell that to people and it can push them away. So we work, we, we're, we're in a group of friends who understand one another and we support each other. And there's something about when you write and you read to another person and you laugh together about, about what you were just thinking. It's not always funny, but it often is. And I love that. I love it when my fears are revealed to me to just be funny and uh, I get more lighthearted about it. Other times I, I have fearful or resentful thoughts. And when all the stuff is cleared away after I've used my the daily practice, what's left is, you know what? I got to do something about that. That actually is a problem. So we just get more clear headed and lucid. Whenever I've avoided the daily practice, it was, it was always because I was in a terrible relationship. And I think I knew on some level that if I were to name my fears and resentments and that feeling of like clarity and truth came in, I would know that I'd have to leave the relationship. And like so many CPTSD kids, it's easy to get it. It's, it's all too easy to get into a relationship and it's almost impossible to get out. That abandonment wound is just like, you know, it's just like a metal collar on you. It's terrible. So we help each other. We help each other just take these things off and be free. You can face reality. Reality feels good. You know, the truth feels good when you're just like, yeah, this is bullshit, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it feels good and you deserve better. So another thing you can do um, is, you know, really stake a claim on what you actually want. Write it down. Don't pull your punches. Don't say, oh, I want a life partner. Like, I don't think you want a life partner. You have a life partner. You want somebody who loves you. And if that's a, if that's a spouse, say it. Um, and I think mostly when I talk to people and ask them to be honest, it's usually that when people say life partner, I say, so that implies no commitment and they go, Oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. I go, so is what you want is your vision that you would have a relationship that doesn't last forever. That at some point people leave, they would go, no, no, I want it to last. And I'm like, well, that's a spouse. That's a spouse. Yeah. You could nitpick about the financial arrangement, but whatever it is that is your heart's desire of what you really most want, like name it, write it down. Just the act of writing it down. This is not magic. I'm not telling you to like manifest it or anything. You just write it down so that you know, so that you're square with yourself, that you're honest with yourself about where you're coming from. And that will start to create an agitation when you're getting into situations that are not that. You don't have spouse material happening here. You don't even have boyfriend material. I mean, somebody who won't call you, that's not, I don't know. This is a thing of convenience. So when that's going on, you're going to feel agitation. It's going to start to feel really wrong. And you're thinking it's wrong. You're writing to me. You're, you're in doubt, but that's because you were, you were programmed as a child to doubt your perceptions. That when you feel like your needs aren't being met, that you're sad, that you're not being loved. It's like, no, actually, you know, everything's fine. You got too good at that. It's time to take it off. It's time to take it off and let your standards come to the forefront of like, no, I get to be loved. That's what I want. I'm worth it. Pushing people away so that you can be alone is incredibly common with people who grew up with childhood trauma. And it feels like it's the right, best, most self-caring thing you can do sometimes when you're under stress, when you're feeling triggered. And let's just all admit it. For people with CPTSD, hanging out around people is full of triggers. 
It's like a crocodile pit. It's a black hole and it feels so good sometimes to just draw the line, to pull back from everybody and to make an excuse or cancel a plan or end a relationship just so that you can get a little breathing room. But here's the thing. If you keep using isolation to manage your CPTSD triggers, just about every option in your life will gradually close off to you. Now, participating with people is just part of living our lives. And maybe you're good at tolerating your loneliness. You know, I get letters from people like that all the time, but you know what? I don't want you to be good at loneliness. It's better to be uncomfortable with it, to be sad about the relationships that are lost or blocked for you because of your trauma. It is sad. And that grief and that discomfort with being alone is what is going to push you back into connection with people. And this time, if you can learn to heal those triggers that make dealing with people so difficult, you can start to connect with them one little step at a time. And I'll come back to explain how to do that in a minute. But first let's talk about why pushing everyone away feels so freeing and peaceful at first. Let's just get that out on the table. All right. First, isolating yourself is an instant solution to the stress you feel when your CPTSD symptoms are triggered by something, an argument, a mistake, something embarrassing. You feel rejected or judged or ugly, or you gained weight or you feel frazzled. It's a way that you can shut the door on all those unpleasant feelings for a while. Second, once you get triggered and that really kicks in, your emotions rise up, your mind starts distorting things. You feel overwhelmed. And honestly, when you get that dysregulated, it can take days to bounce back and feel like yourself. There's a huge temptation to just avoid the triggers altogether or to use what I call covert avoidance. And those are strategies that you can keep looking good, like you're connecting with everybody, but they're really, you're just keeping your relationships as hollow as possible. You're not showing up for people. You might not be conscious, but you're like, avoiding commitments, canceling plans, not really being present with them when you're hanging out with them. This is really common for people with CPTSD. Putting yourself out there when you're a covert avoider, it just feels like it's going to be exhausting, right? It feels like it's going to be just like a marathon that never ends. So you avoid, it's very tempting. And by the way, if you feel that childhood trauma has affected your ability to connect and feel comfortable with people, I have a quiz that you can take to check if you have the common symptoms of that. There's a link to that download right down in the description section below this video. It's called the connection quiz, and you might want to check that out. All right. The third reason why isolating is so tempting is that social situations stress you out and it's just so easy to cancel. If you're a little bit avoidant, I'll bet that you've told every story in the book to get out of plans. Just tell them you're sick, tell them you have to work and they say, okay. And it's just such a relief, right? Now you don't have to deal with all those people. And it feels really good at first. It feels empowering to have that control over your time, even though you kind of got it dishonestly. It feels good to give yourself that space. Probably you were very hungry to have a little space and a little control over your time but it's come to this where you're isolating in order to get it. So the fourth way that isolating can be so tempting is what's happening when you're avoiding everything is you're telling yourself that this is only temporary. You just need a rest. You just don't like this one person. You just need a little bit of self care time. And in fact, it feels like self care, doesn't it? It's like a little spa for one with Netflix and DoorDash feels like you're doing something good for yourself, but really, how does it feel? How does it feel after you've done it a couple days in a row or a couple weeks or a couple years? If you do it enough times, there's a dread feeling that is really hard to push down. I know I've done it. It, it tends to come up and haunt me about three in the morning and I can't sleep. I just feel like that life is passing you by. And it'll start to get more stressful not having real relationships in your life than it is having them. So when you're promising yourself that soon you'll get back out there, just remember, you know, the longer you aren't out there, the harder that gets. 
And sometimes the isolation will cause you to go deeper into behaviors that trigger the urge to isolate. So it can be kind of a downward spiral. It can begin to feel like an addiction where you even feel drawn to like experiences of overwhelm or exhaustion because then you can give yourself permission to keep isolating. That's when you know you're in a bad spot. Okay, so let's talk about why it's so important to fight that urge to isolate, to come out of loneliness, even when it's hard. And the first reason is you need people in your life. I know you know that, but I'm just gonna say it out loud. You need people in your life. Even if you didn't have emotional needs for people, your immune system needs to be around people. Your mental health needs to experience people. Your physical health needs to be around people. And when you're actually connecting with people, it has this really healthy effect of just kind of soaking up self-absorption. Self-absorption is what fills up all that space where your friends belong, right? it ends up being this big focus like how do i feel what's going on what's about to happen and you get out there with people and your attention comes off of that and you start to have a more balanced view all right being with people helps to keep your thinking grounded and i would just like to point out some people have felt a little hurt when i say this but if you've ever known people who aren't into people and they're like hiding out and they're avoiding people maybe when you were younger you saw people who had been doing it for years and they were older being a hermit actually makes people start to act weird and I know you know it's true and what it comes from is there's just a total lack of socialization there our fears can get the better of us our sort of biased thinking can sort of just keep escalating and escalating when there's nobody there to push back on you or give you a reality check and so yeah we get weird we also need to be around people, not just so that we can act like not weird, but so that we can be useful to people. I believe strongly that our happiness, it's not just a feeling, it's something that is really, really developed as we grow into being our real selves and becoming useful to other people, being of service to them, helping them out a little bit. Not like being codependent, not doing too much, but being connected enough that you can show up for people. You can attend community meetings, you can check on a neighbor, you can run an errand for somebody, you can take a phone call from somebody who's sad. Those are facets of showing up that are actually really good, not just for the other person, but for you. You need to be playing this role for your continued development or it traps you. It's like a developmental barrier. You can't mature if you're not having those interactions with people. Also, speaking of maturing, it's so important to have people who are caring for you. If you're sick, if you have an injury, you need to be cared for. And in this past couple of years, 2020, 2021, we've seen the example of people who ended up isolated and didn't have those relationships in place and there was nobody to care for them. And it's one of the saddest things there is. This is a good time to make a commitment. Just say, you know, I'm gonna do my best to be connected to people so that when the time comes that I have to be isolated or I'm in the hospital, that I have people to support me. And one way you can do that is you can be that person for others. A most important reason that you need to be connected to others is that you have gifts to bring to the world. And the gifts are not the same as talents. Talents are things you're good at. Gifts are things that you have, that, you, that have been bestowed on you for the benefit of others. And if you don't have others in your life, you can't use your gifts. I spent years not using my gifts. I felt empty and hollow and had this constant feeling that I was missing out on life. And when I began to get busy and get into action, when I started doing Crappy Childhood Fairy, it started as a blog. I started writing blog posts and I shared it and I think two people saw it and I sent emails to everybody I knew, a couple people saw it. But it began to engage me in the process of doing something for the benefit of others. And it lifted me up so much that I had the, I had the focus and the energy to write a second blog article and another one another one and then here we are five years later here we are together it, I've, it's the greatest joy of my life we need other people so that we can flourish and so that we can become ourselves now it might not feel possible to you right now to step out of your comfort zone whether that is deep isolation or something that you're doing that's a little more covert where you're out there with people but just avoiding real connection in your life but that feeling of difficulty is exactly why now is a good time to fight the urge to isolate. What you can do instead of isolating in order to protect your triggers is you can learn to calm those triggers and then you won't need to isolate. If you can start to get mastery over those triggers and the dysregulation that results, which is totally normal for people who grew up with, with abuse and neglect, if you're new to this channel, we talk a lot about that here, 
dysregulation. It's a neurological state where we, we get overreactive and anxious and discombobulated. It's not a good way to live your life. When you learn to calm your triggers, dysregulation doesn't kick off. Neither does that disconnection from people. Neither does the self-defeating behavior that, that has been dogging you all your life, whether that's an addiction or an attraction to people who treat you badly or an inability to care for yourself. There are a number of ways that we fall into self-defeating behavior. And that's what happens. There's the original trauma, not your fault. Then there's the triggers, the dysregulation, the disconnection and the self-defeating behavior. And when you're healing, once you can heal those triggers and dysregulation, you, you are now on a level playing field where you can start to deal with the self-defeating behaviors. Everybody has some. We're all works in progress right now. It feels good to start facing one of them that's been giving you trouble and you can get going on that. So learning to calm your triggers, that's the skill that will set you free. It's so clear how a person's relationship with their parents when they were small plays a huge role in how their romantic relationships take shape later. And this is what we're talking about when we describe attachment styles. There are five basic styles. Secure, which is people who were well-loved as kids and they feel generally safe and flexible in relationships. Then there's anxious preoccupied, which is people who worry all the time that they're not getting enough love, it's gonna go away. Then there's the dismissive avoidant, and uh, then there's the fearful avoidant, and there's the disorganized attached person. Those last three, the dismissive avoidant, the fearful avoidant, the disorganized person, they, these three, they have trouble giving love in a way that makes insecure people feel okay. So I've noticed that in videos and online, a lot of discussion is by insecure types like me about how to understand and cope with all the other attachment styles. Today though, my letter is from a woman I'll call Lisa, who self-identifies as the avoidant one. And she wants to know how she can be a better partner. I think that's great. So let's look at what Lisa says. She says, hi, Anna. I've been struggling with my healing journey with CPTSD, and I wanted to write you in hopes to gain guidance on how to handle my trauma and triggers now that I'm 25 and wanting to be healthy. All right. When I was born, my angry, manipulative, post-military narcissist father was abusive on every level, mentally, emotionally, physically, and sexually. Okay. I'm circling stuff. I'll come back on a second reading, but let's go all the way through and see what Lisa has to say. He never took accountability and never allowed us to express our thoughts or feelings. I have two older sisters, but I got the worst of it. We always lived on survival mode and grew up walking on eggshells. I understand that he was just projecting his own pain, but that doesn't help the triggers or trauma I'm dealing with today. My mom was unconditionally loving, but was submissive toward him and was living in a state of fear for her own life and her kids, and she was depressed. She did her best, but she wasn't able to protect us from him because he was too powerful. A few years later, my mom found the support and strength to get away from him and filed for divorce. And I refused to see him again. At this time, I was getting bullied really heavily. Uh, and I was told to end my life and that I would never be good enough or pretty enough by the kids at school. Damn kids. I was in a lot of pain at this time. When I was 14, my mom got diagnosed with cancer and passed away two weeks after we found out. I ended up having to move states to live with my aunt, who's very critical, made me feel like a burden, always compared me to others and gave, gave me body dimorphism. That's where you're like picking on yourself all the time, finding flaws with yourself. I, I was never enough for her. I also understand where her pain stems from, and I realize that it's a product of how she grew up and feels about herself. It still doesn't make it easier not to internalize. When I was 18, I moved out on my own, and in the years to come, I dated a few guys who all cheated on me, compared me, and made me feel like a burden to love. Mm. It really made me have so many trust issues and low self-esteem. Flash forward to now, I met such a beautiful soul last year, and he and I have been dating for about six months. He truly loves me and shows me what a true partner is and is very healthy and secure. The only problem is I realize that I have adopted some behaviors from my family and exes that I've been subconsciously projecting onto my very loving boyfriend, and I've drained him in many ways. 
such as fear of intimacy. I have an anxious avoidant attachment style. A lot of fears, insecurities, difficulty trusting, emotional unavailability, controlling tendencies, defensiveness, not feeling lovable, and worst case scenario, assumption thinking. He has been wonderful and he supports my healing journey and loves me through it. I feel as, as I am just hurting him by being so traumatized and I can understand why he feels so drained. I was wondering if there's any guidance you have to help overcome all of this CPTSD trauma and how to stop assuming the worst outcome or thinking the worst of my boyfriend and myself, as well as how to show up for him in a loving way while I'm getting triggered. Also, since I deal with hefty self-doubt and worthiness issues, is there any guidance you have on how to heal that fully and create a healthy, secure attachment? I love my boyfriend so much, and I'm here not to self-reject or self-sabotage and hurt him anymore through my pain. Do you think I can have a healthy partnership with him and myself after having all that abuse and pain? If so, how do I do that? Lisa. Okay. Gosh, Lisa, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. Uh, your trauma was pretty heavy. That was, uh, I'm so sorry all of that happened to you. You know, with the dad and the violence and, uh, and then losing your mom, you know, after a two week illness with cancer when you were 14 and then an aunt who wasn't into you and picked on you. I can just totally understand why everything got hard for you. I can just totally understand it. And I, it sounds to me like you do have some compassion for yourself, but that's the thing. Like we have sympathy for ourselves, ideally that this happened. It wasn't our fault. It hurt us. And we still have a responsibility to try to overcome the behaviors that sabotage us and that hurt other people. So I'm just really proud of you. Like you're so focused on a caring mission to overcome your trauma so that you can be good to somebody else. That's a very good goal. I'd love you for that. If everybody who ever had trauma did that, it would be a wonderful world, right? And that's what everybody's here watching. And so just thank you for being an example to all of us about how it's possible to have optimism and to take positive actions, even when you've been through something terrible. I'm really happy you found somebody who loves you. That's, that's wonderful. I believe you that the relationship is at risk. I just take you at face value about this. I'm not going to try to say, oh, no, it's fine, or, oh, it's so much worse than you think. I'm just going to take it at face value. It is what you say it is. There's a risk that you're going to ruin it with him. So I thought what was interesting is that you gave such a long list of attributes of yourself that are, you know, some pathological, something wrong. Anxious avoidant, a lot of fears, insecurities, difficulty trusting, emotional unavailability, controlling tendencies, and on and on. And um, you could be right, but anyway, I just I that I noticed that because it shows that you've been working on yourself. I can tell you've been working comprehensively to try to identify what's wrong. That's you know that's very good work. But please don't forget that. <laughs> that those are all accompanied by all the strengths and virtues that you also bring to it. And I know they're there or you would not be being loved right now by a good person, right? You wouldn't have even survived childhood if you didn't have strengths and good things about you, right? You know, that are also going on. So don't forget, you're a mix of things. You are a mix of, of things. Part of even the trauma itself um, has things that it gave you that make you special in a good way. Um, I think a lot of us have grit. A lot of us have empathy for other people who are sad. Mm, a lot of us understand how complicated people can be, that they can on the outside look like everything's together, but be struggling on the inside. Like we have a certain wisdom and strength as a result of growing up with trauma. So just don't be so hard on yourself. You're not just a bundle of faults. You're a bundle of all kinds of things. But this is what we're doing here when we're healing. We're learning to become aware of what might be going wrong, what, might, what we might be doing that's self-sabotaging or hurtful to others, you know, what might be just tripping ourselves and getting in our own way. We become aware of those things. And then gently, with the help of people who have perspective on this too, because you give it to us and we'll just, you know, you could just drown in all this like self-diagnosis. I'm so screwed up. I, don't, I so know that feeling. It's just a horrible feeling to just be like, oh, when I think about it, it's just so many things are wrong with me. How could I even go on? So that's a wrong thought. That's a trauma-driven thought. You have a lot of words, but actually what you're talking about here 
are in, in the approach that I use to heal, what you're talking about is a lot of different faces of what I label as fear and resentment. You know, it's like this anxiety and this anger. Those are like the two emotional buckets that all, all those negative feelings and reactions, they go in there, they're generated there. And to heal your trauma, it can help so much if you have a way to relieve and sort of decompress all that fear and resentment, to release it, to name it and get it out. So I'm always teaching about these techniques that I learned them 29 years ago. My trauma was completely overwhelming. I was not cut, I was not okay at all at the time. Somebody happened to show me a way to name and write my fears and resentments on paper. If you're, th if you, anybody watching, you're thinking of trying this, please take my free course. Don't just go start writing a bunch of negative thoughts on paper that will, that can make you feel worse. This is a specific technique to name and then release um, the fears and resentments and the technique that I can show you. It's time tested. Many people have used it and it will help you on your way. You do this twice a day and then you follow it with meditation and together the writing and the meditation are what I call the daily practice. And I just keep doing it and doing it and I keep overcoming my past in a, in a way that I never thought was possible for myself. When I was, you know, 30 years old, what was happening was my trauma was really like getting out of the bag. Some, I, I had a bad thing happen. I was attacked on the street. Boom. All my trauma opened up. I had childhood PTSD, but it had been kind of contained before then. And it got out and I couldn't function. I couldn't read. I was panicking. I was like, oh my God, you know, somebody save me. I was going to therapy three times a week. Nothing was saving me. And it would just happen in that moment. Somebody showed me how to do this, how to how to do this writing. And it instantly, to be able to write what was bothering me on paper started to feel so much better. Now, again, I, you know, I coach people on this all the time and people who just write what's bothering them. It's sort of like ranting. You can ratchet yourself up this way, but writing, um, and there's research behind this. James Pennebaker from University of Texas in Austin has done research on what he calls emotional writing. People clinically recover faster. They get less sick. They get free of depression faster when they write their, their hurt feelings. The, the feelings that are sad and stressful are going on paper. It's a different brain pathway. It's a different brain pathway than talking about things. So it's, it, it, it can represent a radical departure from what you were maybe conditioned to do, which is talk to friends or talk to a therapist, which can all be helpful, but it's really different than writing it, which can be a way of naming it and getting a release from it, getting it the hold off of you. I just hear a lot of that. There's this self attack going on. So the way your parents didn't take care of you, not only, you know, kind of like left you to fend for yourself, but hurt you. What that can do is it can set you up to have this sort of insatiable need for somebody to kind of get in there and take care of you. And it gets so complicated with like attachment wounds because on the one hand, you can't deal with it. You got to push them away, but it's like, I need you. I push you away. I need you. I push you away. And it's a lot of drama, right? So <laughs> it's okay. It's normal. It's normal. But yeah, it, it can put so much strain on a relationship that it doesn't work. So what can be different is when you take your distressed thoughts instead of, and this is like, we're all conditioned to do this. It's like, honey, honey, I'm feeling kind of anxious. You know, I was thinking about something you said and it made me mad and now I'm sad and now I'm afraid you're going to leave. And we want to have all that through dialogue with them. But if you do that, it can start to, it starts to like set off fireworks and problems and like, Hey, I didn't say that. Now you're making things up and now you're in an argument and an argument can be even more dysregulating. So before you try to talk to your partner about something that you're feeling upset about, or you're worried you did wrong, first, you take it to the paper. First, you take it to the paper and you start, you, you begin. I have fear, you know, for example, uh, I, I shouldn't have put so many demands on Roger, <laughs> made up a name, right? You know, fear, I'm too needy, fear, I was harsh, fear, he's sooner or later, he's going to get sick of me. So I'm just, you know, speculating what your fears might be there. You know, I'm resentful at myself. It could be yourself. It could be somebody else. I'm resentful at myself because I have fear. I didn't read that book that the therapist mentioned and fear now I'm acting out and fear I could have done better and fear Roger will see that I didn't even try. So I'm just making things up about things that you might write if you do this daily practice. And all of these fears come out on paper and then you stop and you take a rest in a very simple restful meditation for 20 minutes. 
ah, just sit down, close your eyes, have a rest. I tell people, you know, you can all get this in the free class that I teach, the daily practice. And um, I will show you a link at the end of the video. But when you do this, all that like, mm, that anxiety, that worry, that, that uh, anxious attachment feeling, those emotions, they go out on the paper and you have a little break from them. And they're gonna come back, you know, they always do. But if you, if you keep releasing them enough times after you write, there's a whole thing that you write at the end to release it or ask for it to be removed. And, and if you do that enough times, you start to get in the habit of actually releasing it and not carrying it around. When you have less of that fear and resentment in here, you have less demands, less accusation, less crying, less fighting coming out of your mouth and coming out towards the people you love. That's how it works. Those feelings have to go somewhere. They have to go somewhere, but talking about them is not always productive. So the daily practice is a way you can name and write them. Some, you can also get a buddy to do it with and read to them sometimes. And um, that's a wonderful thing that we can facilitate in our membership program. We do that. But the first step is to just learn the technique. And that's what I want to encourage people to do. So I think you can save your relationship. Uh, I, I think that's entirely possible. What needs to ratchet down is the negativity and intensity that I'm intuiting you're saying, you know, that you're, you're um, having a lot of inner turmoil about, about the dynamic going on and you're not giving him... Um, you say you're avoidant. So if you're avoidant, that would mean that you're sort of pulling away. You're not being very emotionally responsive to him when he's hurt. So an avoidant can be a good partner, but what they can, you know, they can, there's a compensation you can do. I think, I think avoidants are likely to be avoidant all their lives to one degree or another, but you can teach yourself skills to be a good partner anyway. And what it involves is in a nutshell, you got to meet your partner halfway. So let's say your partner, your partner likes to be verbally reassured that when they say, I love you, that you say, I love you back. When they say, um, uh, that hurt my feelings that you said that you say, Oh, tell me, tell me about that. Why do you feel that way? You don't just go, I'm not going to listen to this again. I'm going in the other room or ignore when somebody, um, is reaching out to say they love you. Uh, the Gottman Institute, a couple, the Gottmans uh, have come up with a technique that's very helpful for couples, I think. And they talk about this idea of bids. Um, members of a couple make a bid to the other one. They're like, ooh, do you think this shirt looks nice on me? That's a bid to like, look at me, pay attention, connect with me. Or you could say, uh, boy, uh, it'd be really nice to sit down and just uh, have dinner together right now. That's a bid. We, we, we say things to try to invite the person to kind of connect with us. And what avoidant people do is whoop, it goes over their head sometimes. And so you want to be, you want to teach yourself to hear the bid that they're asking for your attention and time right now. And it's not wrong. It's a little different than how you would do things if you were in charge of reality, but none of us is. So an avoidant person can meet halfway, but the other person has to have a little bit of allowance. This is an avoidant person. Don't freak out if they're a little bit aloof sometimes. That's how they're wired. They meet you halfway too. And that I think is how people can have a good relationship, even though they have different attachment styles and neither of them have are secure. That's entirely possible. I think you said that your boyfriend does have secure attachment, but you know, you can, different things can work if people are willing to pay attention to what's needed by their partner. Partner. Some people who were abused or neglected in childhood have a tendency to cling to relationships, but other people have the opposite problem. They push people away. Now, if you've ever run away from a good partner who loved you and known that pain, maybe you got overwhelmed and triggered by the intensity, or you got fearful about being so close to somebody, and you slipped into avoiding behaviors like disappearing on them, giving them the silent treatment, lashing out at them so that they would leave or damaging their trust in you. Just know there is a way to change that pattern, to stop fleeing and learn to stay happily in a relationship that you want to be in. I'm Anna Runkel, also known as the crappy childhood fairy. And I teach people who were traumatized as kids to calm their PTSD triggers and grow into better relationships. And I can show you how you can better handle the day-to-day -day ups and downs that all relationships go through that can be so triggering for somebody who had trauma in the past and to get through that without getting emotionally overwhelmed. 
and needing to make impulsive decisions to leave or lash out. Now, I'm talking about this today because I got this beautiful letter from a woman I'll call Nina, and she writes, Dear Anna, I've only recently come to terms with the truth that my childhood was mostly void of emotional connection or support. My invisible normal, she calls it. <laughs> my parents divorced when I was about 10. She was the oldest of four. My father was an active military officer from the time of my birth until my high school graduation, so we moved constantly between our parents' many homes and my father's duty stations. Every connection was temporary. Every attachment equaled some form of eventual sadness and loss in that sort of scenario. As a child and young adult, I also dealt with rejection and condemnation at home and elsewhere for my gender expression and later my sexual orientation. That's so hard. In my earliest dating relationships, late teens, early 20s, I would cling, idealize, and obsess, probably because I was so emotionally and affectionately validation starved as a child. And that starvation really intensified the feelings of early love and of loss in breakups significantly. And at some point, a scale was tipped inside me. Instead of clinging to relationships, I started to mentally, emotionally, and physically withdraw at any sign that a relationship might become destabilized. They were small, unnoticeable ways of detaching at first, building slowly to blow-ups of epic proportion. Instead of working through often fixable issues, subconsciously, I would begin flashing red, thinking, here comes the pain and suffering. This attachment will disappear soon like all the others. You shouldn't have trusted it. Take cover. And it's become so intense that I've more or less sabotaged my last two relationships. Each were six or seven years long. And sabotaged them by combinations of running away, emotionally vacating, causing conflict myself in extreme cases. And, and Nina says she's a normally passive person. And ultimately, by having affairs. I believe I did this in order to create a protective emotional distance around myself and to be in charge, to be the controller and the perceived inevitable pain of the perceived impending loss of the intimate bond. The higher the stakes in love, the bigger the bomb. It's very embarrassing to admit this. It's something I've felt terrible shame and guilt over. I've suffered additional grief over hurting people I cared about along with myself. That's the thing though, my subconscious alarm system is driving me out of instinct, even though my actions have gone against my own morals, even though I swore to myself I would never do it again after the first time it happened. I was hoping maybe you could give some advice. Thank you, Nina. Oh, Nina, I'm so sorry. You got a bad hand of cards and I don't think Anybody could have gotten through the childhood you're describing where you get completely invalidated for being who you are and moved around, just constantly moved around so that, you know, a lot of us maybe didn't have that connection with parents. That's common with people with CPTSD. But if you can't also have friends, that is the double whammy that is, it's, it's devastating. And I can, I, I actually think you've done amazingly well. You've done really well. You've had a couple of long-term relationships. You have this incredible self-awareness here. Uh, you, you seem to understand very closely how your mind works, what happens in your feelings, how it's connected to what happened. So all that, you're like, you're like right there on the ramp to taking off and getting free. So I'm really proud of you. <laughs> you're in a good spot. So what we're talking about here are attachment wounds. And I think you know that attachment wounds um, are the sort of like spiritual, psychic and neurological damage that happen to kids when they, they don't have parents paying proper attention to them and giving them that unconditional love and validation. All right. You didn't get to have that. You didn't get to have that. And so it's understandable. It's not your fault that you have difficulty in this area. And sometimes I like to think of these as it's a developmental delay, right? <laughs> You've, there's so many parts of you that are mature and wise here, but it sounds like there's a little area that got kind of frozen in time and you didn't get to totally develop that area. And so when you've had these longer term relationships, the way things get intense at that point, the way you really have to count on somebody, 
just starts to trigger something all the way over. And, you know, probably I'm going to imagine that these relationships, though they lasted, there were signs of your of your avoidant stuff like all along, right? Uh, am I right? So it was probably there all along, but these people loved you and they stuck by you and they kept trying to work it out and then something happened that you just, that it really blew things up. And so there's your, that's your developmental delay. That's the CPTSD, get putting a, throwing like a wrench in the whole thing and getting in the way of your happy life and your lifetime attachment that you'd like to have, your lifetime partnership. And so there's very good literature out there about attachment wounds and attachment styles, and those are good things to know. What you're talking about is being avoidant. There's a couple of types of that, you know, anxious or secure avoidant. And um, whatever you decide you are, that's fine. There's ways that people who have different styles can learn to work together. So it's worth knowing. And you are very self-aware. If you weren't, if you were writing like, I don't know what's wrong with me, I'd say, you need to tell your story. Um, but if you've told your story, if you are very familiar with what happened and you're still finding that your recovery is not moving forward, and that's where a lot of us got, you know, uh, that's, I went to therapy, I told my story, and very soon I had already told the whole thing. Repeating the story wasn't getting me any closer to changing the way that I attached. There's two things that did help me and I want to share them with you. And I'll tell you what they are up front and then I'll go a little deeper into them. And one is, you have to learn to notice and calm those triggers when they pop up. Now they are sneaky. Those triggers come up and you don't even know what's happening. Sometimes you don't even realize that your CPTSD came, that it's like a monster. You know, it just comes in like, it just comes in like grabs you by the brain and you don't even know what hit you. <laughs> and it could be a day and a half later when you're like, whoa, that whole thing just happened to me. I got dysregulated. I lost my sensitivity to what was happening. My thinking got distorted. I started to say hurtful things. I did some damage. Now I'm filled with remorse. I'm out in some hotel, you know, doing the same old drill that's happened before. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like when CPTSD takes over. It can take anywhere from, you know, 30 minutes to uh, 30 days to sort of calm down out of that heightened state of dysregulation that makes it seem like you have to leave. You've just got to get out. And um, I think a lot of people in this community know that feeling, even when they're the clinging types. Sometimes, sometimes clinging balances itself out by just like running the heck away. It just runs away. And it seems very real when it's happening. It seems like it's going to solve something. But I'm sure you know so well that feeling of emptiness and remorse and guilt and shame that come when you're sitting in your car, you know, an hour away, <laughs> from home and you did this to somebody again and you know how they're, now you remember, like you remember the emotional impact of what you're doing. So anyway, we understand CPTSD does that. The two things that I'm going to suggest you do, here they are. The healing part is to become aware of that. All right. Is to become aware of that. When you can notice when your triggers are getting set off, now they, and they will tell you, they give you signs. All right. For me, I, my nose gets numb. I start having this yucky thought, I don't need you. I don't need anybody. So I know myself now and I know like I'm, if I'm thinking that thought, mm, just stop talking right now. All that's going to come out of my mouth when I'm having that thought is something not true and hurtful. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want things to get better. So I close my mouth and I do the second thing, the second thing um, that's part of that, which is to discharge those negative thoughts and get them out of my head so that I can sort of come back to and gain perspective. Now, how do you do that? What I do is I use this writing technique. I teach it to everybody, everybody who will learn it. <laughs> Tens of thousands of people. There's always a link below my videos in the description section. It's called the daily practice. It's a writing technique. Um, you, it's very subtle. You might be surprised how helpful it is. Give it a try. It, um, it's done together with some meditation and those two together can really help calm the triggers. So finally, and this I think is the most important thing. I didn't used to really know this, but I'm sure seeing it now, the more I coach people, the more I teach people in courses, the more I'm really getting it. Connection to people. It is very, very difficult to do any substantial healing without being connected to other people. And I can't totally explain why that is. It's just my observation. 
in my membership program, there are people, you know, everybody takes all my courses. And a lot of the people, they never come and do the group things. We have these, we have these group coaching calls and daily practice calls. We have a secret Facebook group. And so there's, I don't know, about 400 and some people who come and participate in, in all of that. And they amaze me with the progress that they make. And they, I, I pop in sometimes and I look at what people are talking about on Facebook. Now they're putting together um, peer-led daily practice groups. They're supporting each other. They're forming friendships. These are people who, when they first came in, they were saying that they, you know, could barely form a friendship. And, you know, especially in this last year, 2020 and 2021, there has been so much isolation. And I'm just watching people like break free and connect and heal and... I, it's really like changed my understanding of healing that it's not just something that we do for ourselves. It's not just a thing of like getting those fearful and resentful thoughts out or knowing what's wrong with us. That it's so clear to me now, we are born into community and we can't escape as much as we want to. Uh, there's a lot of people with CPTSD who have kind of liked the lockdown because a lot of pressure came off of them. But the thing is, so much of the best of us can only be expressed in relation to other people. And I know a bunch of you will say, no, that's not true. I have my dog. Okay, fine. For those of you who are fine, fine. You be fine. But for all of you who want to have better connections and who want to learn to be able to hang in there with a relationship without, without flipping out every time you're triggered and without ruining the darn thing, th I'm telling you, this is what you do. You learn and understand attachment and the wound that happened. Just get your information about that. Most of you are already there. Learn to discharge the fearful and anxious thoughts the, and, and resentful thoughts that would that when you're triggered, activate and cause you to do and say harmful things. See, if you get triggered and you don't act on it, no harm is done and you have time to recover, right? You have time to recover and then you can say something that's more constructive and healing. You can you can express if something's bothering you without blowing up the whole thing. I mean, wouldn't that have changed everything for you? So finally, community, being connected to other people. I strongly recommend that you have people in your life who are either mentors or peers or both peers who you can talk to honestly, who you can be totally open with about your feelings, about things that you feel ashamed about, about things you aspire to, and they can help give you a reality check. There's, even if they don't say anything brilliant, they don't have to be, you know, fancy therapists or anything. The act of telling another person and sharing that with them and they listen, and maybe you being reciprocal with them for that, it has alchemical properties for the healing that you're already doing in yourself. And I won't try to explain it scientifically. Some people probably can, but I just know it's my experience. So I really encourage you. So learn about attachment and what happened to you and what style that gave you and how other people nurture themselves around that and find a way to fit together with people with other attachment styles. Find yourself a method to discharge the fearful and angry thoughts that normally would come flying out of you when you're triggered so that you can have a different reaction, so that you can delay that reaction and respond in a way that you choose, and this time not destroy everything. And finally, stay connected. Have mentors and peers who can hear you honestly and give you feedback that you can use to guide your growth and complete that phase of development that got stuck so long ago. Right. If you go look at the comments under my videos on YouTube, you'll see basically two kinds of comments. And one is the kind that comes from people who are totally stuck in their early trauma. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people about the adult symptoms of childhood PTSD and how to start recovering so you can get back on the path toward a happy and connected life. And I emphasize connection because I believe that at its heart, childhood PTSD is an injury to the ability to connect. That injury to connection is the starting point of a whole world of problems that so many of us experienced as a consequence of abuse and neglect in childhood. 
So to recover from that, I teach people a new way to focus their healing, to shift the focus off the past and off of other people and onto their own symptoms. Because that right here in the symptoms we have, that is where healing is possible. And even though my message about this is like, I say it so many times, it's like a drumbeat. I still get a lot of comments and emails from people who are on a different path. And some of them are really stuck in a lot of pain. Now, in case you're in that group and you just haven't come to one of my courses yet or my coaching or one of my Zoom calls, I wanna tell you how to get out of that stuck group and into the other group, the group that's not stuck, they're healing, they're moving forward, they're changing their lives. And I'm gonna describe how they're doing it. Now, I'm not a doctor or therapist. I'm just someone who recovered from my own childhood PTSD. And I've learned from both my own experience and from working with thousands of people who went through neglect and abuse in their childhood. And because I've watched some people have amazing breakthroughs that changed their lives, and I've witnessed other people stay miserable and stuck and disconnected, I've come up with a couple of observations. Now, if you're miserable and not progressing the way you want to, the way you, you need to progress, I want you to stay with me here just through the end of the video so you can see what I'm seeing as I hear from all of you who engage with my content about the patterns that are working and the patterns that are really just making people who want to move forward feel miserable. So, okay, two basic self-concepts that I'm observing. The first is what I notice in people who are working really hard to figure out the problem caused by their experiences and to find the solutions that seem to help them get better. Now, not everything they've tried may have been helpful, but they're active in this project and noticing where they got lifted up and where it didn't really work, where they fell short. And in the comments, you'll, you'll, if you read them, they're sharing these nuggets of their own wisdom. They'll say, I tried X, Y, and Z, and X really sucked, and Y was amazing. And there are clear signs in them, signs that I normally recognize that someone is actually healing. They will say that they're getting along better with people. They feel more at ease uh, in groups or when they're alone. And this is kind of an advanced stage of healing. Their talents and their gifts will start emerging and filling up their lives with a sense of purpose and actions that are helpful to other people. Now for this first group, they're subscribing to my channel because, and this is what they tell me, it's practical, it's solution oriented. It's based on not just theory, but real experience about healing that they relate to. They're feeling not alone anymore. And for people who are having a breakthrough in their healing like this, it feels exciting to try out new tools and ideas and see if there's something in there they can use. They want inspiration, they want action steps, they're ready to go. Now you can tell I like that group, right? But I also love the second group. And these are the folks where the breakthrough simply hasn't happened yet. They're good people, they've worked hard on their healing, and a lot of them are knowledgeable about the treatments out there, and they've tried a lot of them, but the healing has not come. And so this group can be very, very discouraged, and they've come to feel helpless and hopeless. And you can see it in the comments they write, that deep down inside, they've stopped believing that healing is possible for them. That right there. And where that leaves a person, and you see it, it reflected in their comments, is in bitterness. So people who are going through this will have a lot to say about things outside themselves, family members, parents, siblings, exes, the people who said they would help them but couldn't or wouldn't, um, the hospitals or therapists or institutions that made them feel unimportant and unseen. And people in this state of discouragement can tell you very clearly what's wrong with all the other people, what ought to change. And, and, and they can tell you what their pain is like. That's common. That's okay. But this second group, the discouraged and stuck group, what's also clear is that they have a very vague or non-existent concept of themselves, of what they'd be like without the emotional pain. The pain becomes everything as if it's who they are. And so they can't see themselves in a different future state where things have changed for the better. They can't even imagine it and what that might be like, what day-to-day -day life would feel like if they weren't trapped inside their own symptoms. So that's what I mean by stuck. Now, getting stuck in pain and isolation is a very traumatized thing to do. And it happens to everybody sometimes. But if you want to break out of that 
you've got to, and you might recognize this phrase from another context, but you've got to break the wheel. And what I mean by wheel is the churning negative thinking and emotion states that go round and round within us, the blame, the obsession with people who hurt you, the withdrawal from life, the struggling, the failure, the ways you never felt accepted or seen, and the stories that we end up telling ourselves over and over about why we are the way we are. And it's not that these stories aren't true, but if we can't stop the spinning on those stories, the wheel just gets stronger. And the wheel is simultaneously like a vacuum that sucks everything into it, and it's like a centrifuge. It pushes everything off. So it spins and it throws off and scatters everything that you care about, people who love you, wonderful opportunities in your life to have fun or, or have financial security, have joy and humor. It just, cool, you know, it just goes away. And as devastating as it is, the wheel is also very seductive because it looks like it's going to make you feel better. And that's why I use this metaphor that you can't just slow down the wheel. You can't just ask it a lot of questions why it is the way it is or analyze it or look at the trajectory of everything it throws off. You just have to shove a big stick into that wheel and break it. And if that's a violent image, don't worry. What you can picture is that the wheel's made of air because it is, it's not even real. And when you break the whole thing, it evaporates like a cloud. It's gone. You thought the wheel was going to make you feel better, but did it? You thought the wheel had ruined your life, but has it? Has it done that already? You thought that the wheel would protect you from triggers of other people, but it doesn't. It actually just kept you stuck in pain and made you see nothing but helplessness. But you know what? You're not helpless. There's a whole wide world of experiences out there. If you can get just a little breathing room, just to get started from that cycle of fear and anger and analysis and diagnosis and blame and more fear, right? Thinking and talking about this stuff doesn't make it go away. It goes away. And remember, all you need is just a little breathing room. It goes away when just for a moment you can release the story and open yourself up to a new and fresh experience of yourself and your capabilities, because you are capable. You're capable in present time of changing these things. Now the focus needs to come off of time past and off of other people and onto the only thing you can heal, which is yourself and the knowledge that right here, right now, through practical steps, you open the door to that healing process by changing your mental state. Now I know that's hard, but I can teach you how to do it. You are not helpless. This is hopeful. For there to be hope, you need to just have a vision, an ideal, and you need to have a belief that healing is actually possible for you inside your own healing. Where, whether or not other people change or circumstances change, this is the crucial sign that someone is on a good path. They recognize their own agency and they begin to see choices. Even when CPTSD puts nothing but horrible choices in front of you, you have a choice. And despite the symptoms you have today, you can move one foot in front of the other toward the healed life that you need, that you deserve. And it starts in the way you regard the possibility of your own healing. Because if you're telling yourself that you're totally damaged, that you're hopelessly screwed up, then whether you mean to or not, you're disconnecting with your life and all the people in it. People generally have a lot of compassion, but when they sense that negative wheel spinning, it's like a hum you can feel in other people, right? And what do you do? You pull away. And the very thing that you're longing for, which is for them to come toward you, to help you, to be connected with you, it can happen. And you're like, why can I not get some support? Why doesn't anyone believe in me? Can't they see I need some help? And yeah, it's a harsh place to be. So how do you even begin? If you can just do one thing today, I'll keep it really simple for you. Just get it into your mind, what it will feel like when your PTSD reactions to life are reduced. You want to give it a little try? Okay, let's take a minute and walk you through it. Imagine that you're in a stressful situation that's normally triggering for you. A party, um, being at work, getting your feelings hurt by somebody you care about. Now remember what it's like when you start getting dysregulated and reactive to the situation, okay? We're just going to dwell on that very briefly. Don't go way into it, but just, just try to remember what that's like. You might feel tight, 
your heart races, you, you want to lash out, maybe you want to go silent, you want to get numb, and you get scared that that same old part of you that screws things up and always comes out when you're triggered is going to happen again. Okay, that's all you have to do. Let that go. Now, in comparison, imagine you're in that situation, but your PTSD symptoms are 50% less. All right, you feel a little rise when you're triggered, but it doesn't go over the top. You don't lose control. You still have choices about what you say, what your facial expression is. You can decide to stay in the situation or not stay. You have that flexibility. So would that kind of reduction in your symptoms change how that all turned out for you? Would that make a difference in your life if you could do that long term whenever stressful situations came up? Would, would being strong in this way allow you to change some of your circumstances, um, relationships, career, physical health, your ability to share your gifts with the world? Things you couldn't even imagine before because you've been working so hard just to try to see how you get from where you are to just a little bit ahead. But now there's something way more possible out there for you. And if you can just let that in a minute, what you've just done is you've joined the ranks of the first group I described, the ones who can see a better future and who are more likely than anyone else to actually get there. So see if you can let that in today. You can just kind of sit with it or you can take action steps on it. You can click on the links to my courses if you want to. They're always below my videos in the description section. And if you're only ready for one small step though, try this. Just stop telling yourself the terrible story of your life. You break the wheel when you can believe and connect with a better vision of yourself. And then when you start taking action on it, even if it's small action, it leads to change. You can do this. I've seen many, many people with really difficult pasts begin with small steps in that positive direction, and then it gains momentum and it gains momentum and soon real substantial life changes are carrying them off into the future. And this can happen for you. You can change. One of the most popular topics in all my YouTube videos is the problem of loneliness and isolation. And I knew that this was common for those of us with childhood PTSD, but oh my gosh, from the comments and the email I've received from all of you, I learned that loneliness is not just common, but a core issue for a huge proportion of us. And I'm gonna talk about one aspect of it in this video today. My name is Anna Runkle, by the way, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and this is the seventh video in my nine-part series on resilience. Now, I'm breaking down some of the big obstacles that stand in the way of healing past trauma, as well as the strengths that we can develop to overcome those obstacles. And the one that I want to talk about today that's a little hard to explain, but very connected to loneliness and isolation, is what I will call defendedness. It's a weird word, right? But what I mean is a kind of fragility that we get sometimes we're fragile, right? Where we think we can't handle being around something that bothers us. So we try to control it. Like we control other people by telling them what they can and can't say around us. Like don't use that word. Or we make elaborate rules that we think we need other people to follow in our company. Like don't make jokes in front of my friends or don't eat, I don't know, ham in front of me because it reminds me of this thing that upsets me. You know what I mean by fragile and controlling? Now, what we're trying to do when we're defended is not get triggered, right? Because for us, it's really costly to get triggered. We get all dysregulated and we might lose hours or days in terms of the ability to function and focus. And that can seem like it makes sense because when we're triggered, it's hard to function, hard to be friendly, hard to go to work. So we get points for good intentions here. And you know what? Some people will play along with our rules, but trying to keep your PTSD brain regulated by controlling other people, it just never quite works. Defendedness is not a boundary. So don't confuse the two. Defendedness is an obstacle. It's a wall we put up. And we think we're blocking out triggers, but what we block out is basically everything, including surprises, including things that will help us grow, and especially we block out connection. So this is a long background talk about how we use defendedness to try to maintain some safety. But ultimately, defendedness makes us lonely. Now here's why defendedness was never gonna make you safe. There's no safety because putting up walls only puts you in prison. You're never going to be able to make the world 
be just how you want it to be. So when are you ever going to be able to get out of that prison? The future? No. What you can do is calm the trigger. And this is what I teach in my Healing Childhood PTSD course. You can save all that energy that you're spending trying to control your environment and instead enjoy your life by simply growing more neutral to the things that used to upset you. Now, of course, I'm not saying that you should be neutral in the face of abuse. We don't tolerate abuse. We still get to say no to things and we walk away from what we don't want. But if we choose to stick around, we can be more open-minded and accepting that people are different. They're not all like us. They don't fit what we want and that is absolutely okay. When you know that and you're not so triggered by people having different opinions and wants and ways of expressing themselves, you'll become more appreciative of the goodness in most people, the wonder of them. And when you can start to shift into this less defended mode of interacting, life unfolds for you and it reveals to you what you were looking for in the first place, which is connection and meaning. Now I know these are the things that were taken from you when you were abused and neglected as a kid. And back then staying safe meant defending yourself against people and life. But now there is a way to be more open to it all, to love and be loved defenselessly and still keep yourself intact and safe. There's a way. It has to be learned, but there's a way. And that is the strength that you're going to need to break through the walls you've put around yourself. You probably weren't expecting me to say that, but the strength is love. You calm inside with nice shiny boundaries, motivated by love for other people. I'm telling you, increase the love. Now, codependence is not love. Trying to make people love you is not love. Love is the energy that you bring to people you encounter in this day, no matter what's gone on for you in the past. And you can increase the love in the world in this way. And this is where your loneliness gets healed. You walk the path of love.